Okay, thank you. So, uh, how's it in the back? How is somebody speaking for you? So you able to hear? If it drops too much, let me know. In fact, if anything, if you can't see what I see, what I think I'm showing, things like that, because I'm going to use the board and the screen. And, um, you know, as I tell all my students, if I make a mistake on the board in class, it's my fault. If you don't point it out, then it becomes your fault. So, um, also, if you have any questions at any point, just interrupt. I, I, it's kind of fun to have a conversation. Um, I, I like to hear myself talk, but it, it's nice to interact a little bit too. Um, yeah, so so where to begin? Uh, maybe I should say that uh, long before most of the people were born, uh, long before any of these students were born, I uh, I was an undergraduate too. I actually went to the University of Dayton, which is not that far from here. And uh, one of the things I remember uh, from my undergraduate training is learning to get math talks. They were, there, were, there were a couple of faculty there who were really adamant that we needed to get math talks. And in those days, I went around giving talks about the isoparametric inequality. Who knows what the isoparametric inequality is? Or people are being really dependent. Yeah, it's a, a you know, all, all geometric figures but with the same perimeter, the circle um, maximizes area, that's it. And I've done a lot of things since those days. Given lots of talks, learned a lot of math, and forgotten most all of it. But if you stop me on the street this day and say, "What about that isoparametric inequality in John Killer?" Um, I could probably give it to you. <laughs> um, yeah, maybe. I hope you will remember your own talks in your sense too. Okay, so um, uh, you can be. For, uh, if somebody asks you. Uh, you know, what is math about? It's always sort of a difficult question, and you give different answers at different times in your life. Um, but, you know, at least at some time in your life, you know, after you got over the math is about numbers, or you might say math is about, say, solving equations. And uh, when I look back on my own education and when I watch what my kids are learning in school, it is remarkable to me how much of the K-12 training goes into sort of supporting this idea. So at first you learn about counting numbers, so you are set up later on to solve equations like this. And then at some point they start telling you about fractions. So later on when you run into an equation like this, you're like, cool, I can, I can solve that. And uh, then at some point, they tell you about negative numbers. And so when you get into algebra, like your prep is all stuff like this. And maybe then you, you take on real numbers. And, uh, then you're ready to solve equations like this and so on. And uh, then you get into algebra and you, you put all these different number systems you learn to work. Maybe, I mean, maybe you were lucky enough, I guess, to take on later for most people. How many people learn to solve this equation in? You know, before they graduated high school. Okay. Yeah, most of them, okay, so complex numbers. I did. <laughs> There's a lot I didn't learn. Um, <laughs> right. So, so you, you're all prepped to solve equations, and then they present you with, uh, you know, one equation after another that, you know, and, and, and you can solve them all, and you get the impression that this is what it's all about. Um, and they never tell you the sad truth, and that is that most equations can't be solved. In that. Okay. Um, I actually, uh, even, you know, even something like this, you learn to, you know, you look at it now, you say x is uh, plus or minus root 2. Done. All right. But, you know, you call that a solution? I mean, it's just a name. <laughs> right? It's a great solution. Well, you, it, it does at least indicate that you know there are two solutions. That, that's information. But beyond that, why does that X is plus or minus smiley face? Um, <laughs> um, okay. But actually, I mean, the, the moment the realization hit me that my training was not serving me as well as I thought it would was when I, I did some programming for physicists as well graduate. And uh, I don't really remember the physics at all. I don't think I ever knew it um, as I was doing this. It's something that you think about statistical physics. But I, we had all these eight degree polynomials, and I had to find the roots of an eight degree polynomial. Um, and 
There are no tools for it, right? You know, I, I knew the quadratic formula. I knew that it was a cubic formula. It would kind of peter out after fourth degree polymer. And, um, you know, so I learned, I, I learned a whole lot from that project about, you know, how you just start, instead of solving equations, how you start approximating solutions to equations. So, lower the bar just a little bit and worry about approximately solving equations, then you're back to business. And there's a whole world to discover there. So in some sense, that's what this, this talk is about. Specifically, it's about Newton's method, which most of us were in calculus at some point. I'm curious, can I take um, maybe another poll here? Who was interested in knowing my audience? I was not that impressed with Newton's method. It was just like, it's a pain in the neck to sit there with a pencil and paper and grind out approximations. <laughs> I much prefer, you know, stuff like that, or, you know, exactly finding the area under, you know, sign between zero and five or two or whatever. Who was really impressed with Newton's method? You can be honest. We thought this is so much cooler than all those stupid integral tricks. Okay, well, you were you had better taste than that. Day. I mean, later on, it was very, you know, now, now I know the truth. It's great. Okay, so what this talk is about, let me see, I lost the ability to unblank the screen. What do I need? It's that one. Okay. Oh, okay. There. Um, this talk is about this specific paper. Okay, how to find all the roots of a complex of complex polynomials by Newton's method uh, by three authors. Um, I learned about this paper when I was a postdoc at Cornell University. Um, to me, it's you know, it's just like yesterday. But if you look at the date. Um, how many of you were born before that? <laughs> not so many. It's not such recent history anymore. All right, so we'll get to that paper, uh, but I need to start uh, at the beginning here. So where, what do I get? Ah, right. I should just beamerize this, sorry. This fault. This is this is Isaac Newton. He was the first one to uh, suggest this idea for finding um, finding roots. Or he actually just applied it to solve a particular finding roots of a particular polynomial. So so from now on, when I say solving equations, I'm going to mean I'm always going to mean this f of x equals or any any equation that I want to consider is, is going to be, you can put it in this form at least. So I'm going to stick to this equation. And um, Newton's method is a scheme for, for finding x that solve that. So let me go to pictures just to remind you of the way it works. Okay, this is, I didn't do this. I just grabbed this off the web. Somebody's GeoGebra app. In fact, I should say, it's Natalia McClellan, who is apparently still teaching math. I think maybe in Oregon. Does anybody know this woman? Well, she wrote this and I found it. So I'm going to use it here. So this, this is a picture of Newton's method for solving exactly this equation, finding the square root of two, x squared minus two equals zero. And the way Newton's method works is, well, I don't know what the answer is, but I'll take a guess. So in this case, the guess is two, okay? And the guess is wrong, usually. So what you do is you evaluate the function at that point, find a point on the graph, and at that point, you say, okay, I'm wrong. Um, but then you pretend the function is linear. This is, this is a huge thing. So Newton's method is really, it really is a method. It should be reduced to a formula. Take a guess, say x naught. Um, and then pretend f is 
linear. So f of x is f at x naught plus f at point, which is a mathematical correct term here. The linear approximation of that, you set that equal to zero, and you solve, and you get a new guess. So you solve this for x, and that's my x1. And the thing about it is, the thing that's great, well, there are many things. But one thing, so, so my area, as was mentioned, is complex dynamical systems. And a dynamical, I should have said, a dynamical system, what you have, is maybe a, a set of states, and you have some function um, from that set to itself. And you think, oh, what can I do if this is my present for Christmas, and I open it, and this is what I find? What can I do? Well, I can take a state, and I can, you know, so an x and x, and and I can take a ball, I can bounce it against the wall, and get another ball. And the thing is, I can do it again because this, the domain and the range are, are the same. So x goes to n of x, goes to n of n of x, goes to, you can do this as often as you like. Um, where the k goes to n k times the k. Anymore. And then in dynamical systems, you ask yourself what happens after a long period of time. You just keep doing this for eternity, but this isn't this many rocks. Um, where does it end up after a long period of time? Okay. Newton's method is just such a method. All right. You don't have to, you can take an approximation, you can improve it, and then you can do it all over again. And this thing was written nicely. Let's see. This panel. Somewhere in here there is was a toggle for the number of iterates. Yes. Top left. Top left. Oh, great. Okay, so if you want, you can do Newton's method 10 times. It does not look like I've done it 10 times to this function. It looks like I've done it, I mean, you look right back there twice, but that's because by the third time I'm so close to the root, you can't see the rest of it. I would have to zoom out a lot for you to see the next test. But I can do Newton's method as, as often as I want and get a good approximation of the root. So it's, it's very nice that way, it's very simple. Um, another feature which I like is if you start with a simple polynomial like x squared minus 2, then n of x comes out being stuff like this. In this particular case, I've got some um, 1 half x plus 2 divided by x. And it has a feature that if you plug in a rational number, you get out a rational number. So if you start with a function, where you start with an equation which has all of integer coefficients and polynomial equation with integer coefficients, you take rational guesses, you get other rational guesses out of Newton's method. So it's very, you know, um, you're not getting bizarre stuff out of here and as you make guesses. All right, so it has that nice feature. Um, is there anything else I want to say about that? Yeah, maybe that's, that's enough for right now. Um, and so it's great that way. And let me uh, just, for in the interest of history, yeah, Newton uh, definitely came up with the idea himself, although he only did it for polynomials. didn't mention any connection with derivatives. Yes, sir. Yes, Dan. Um, when I started getting involved, it doesn't work. Oh, good point. Right. Thank you. That's, that's what I was forgetting to say. Another thing about Newton's method, okay, so the geometric picture is very clear if everything is nice and real here. 
But in terms of formulas, if we go back to the formula, you've got something that's going to work even if you want to put in complex numbers. As long as your function works well with complex numbers, like a polynomial function, like this thing over here, you can plug your complex number in, get a complex number out. At least formally, you can do this. And it turns out to still work pretty well. So thank you. So you can plug in i square root of minus one as a guess. Okay, so as I said, so Newton did this. He didn't mention any connection with calculus. He was always sort of deliberately obscure, so it's kind of hard to know what he knew. Um, Rayson. In, uh, could the, could the I'm sorry? The iterations, could they be represented as series? The oh, yeah, certainly. I mean, you want to, right, right. So, so you start with x0, and then get a new guess, call it x1, and then get a new guess, call it x2. So you get a whole sequence of guesses. And the question is, I mean, the, I mean, in analysis, the question is, does this sequence converge to a root uh, function? Yes. Yeah, is that, is that the gist of Yeah, question? I guess I'm wondering, like, do, do, do you get a, um, do you get a, um, is, is there a functional representation for the series that you would? Um, oh, you mean, can you write that in closed form for the end yeah. of it? Uh, no, not in general. Not in if you could, it, it would be tantamount to saying you could actually write down a formula for a group. Because then you just take the limit of that formula. And, I mean, assuming you could. But it would be very, um, it would be too good to be true. Okay. Yes. Well, I didn't think it's worth pointing out that it's a that was not differentiable anywhere around with an epsilon around the A zero that it had. Right, right. So that is the downside in Newton's method is this F prime. And here you need the function to be differentiable in order to make sense. But at the end of my talk, I want to mention a related method that doesn't have that downside. And it's been, uh, but it's, it's much less studied. Maybe you already know this back then. It's not rockets. Okay. Yeah, I went looking for so so Rayson later on. That's the best picture of Rayson we seem to have. Okay. <laughs> Scoured the web, you know, back in the day. Um, he apparently um, actually published a description of Newton's method, but again without calculus. Um, so my historical research is that I have a friend who studies Galileo. I just had like a month just combing through some Vatican library looking for documents related to. Things related to Galileo. That's not me. I, I just went to Wikipedia for my history. So, um, but I found out something I didn't know. There was a Japanese guy, Japanese mathematician, at the same time as Newton, essentially, who also knew about Newton's method and many other things. This guy, Seki, who knew about Seki? I, I didn't know at all. I, apparently, he did wonderful things with the Antony equations and stuff. But, um, and I, I mean, I guess one moral you could draw is, you know, life isn't fair. We can get all this credit, but he's been a nice guy. Second, who wrote a second? Um, but I mean, to me, the moral is that, you know, math is not about one or two geniuses. It's about having a whole community built up, you know, to support this kind of conversation. So that, you know, somebody hears the tree fall in the forest. Um, but anyhow, that's probably not a great representation either. Um, so the first person to publish a description of Newton's method that uh, that involved actually mentioning derivatives was apparently Simpson of Simpson's rule, Thomas Simpson. Don't entirely trust this picture because there was another Thomas Simpson. And this is like the only, I can only find this picture in one math article and it looks a lot like the other Thomas Simpson. <laughs> so I don't know. Um, okay, and then the next picture I show will bring us much more up to the present. All right. Um, yeah, I, I, I really want to show off Newton's method. There's another method you could use. Uh, I need a competitor. In order to show you how good Newton's method is, I need a competitor. 
So for, for solving an equation like this, there's another probably more natural idea that would occur to me first. And it's the idea behind the proof of the intermediate value term. It's two, so this is f of x equals x squared minus two. You observe that the function, if you plug in well, even one, um, if you plug in one, you get minus one. If you plug in two, you get four. Okay, and since this is a continuous function, you know there's a root in between. And this one of the standard proofs of the intermediate value theorem says you just cut the interval in half, and uh, the value of the function will be either negative or positive there, and you can do whichever half. So if you do that over and over again, that too should converge to this. So in fact, you're guaranteed once you have the right, you know, and if I go ahead and start with the guarantee, point the root, right? But if you try these things out side by side, it's not really a contest. Um, okay. So actually, let me, to be safe, so this is Mathematica. Um, was typically unreadable code. Um, does anybody have that? Did anybody use Mathematica in here? I can't read what I write in Mathematica. Okay. But anyhow, so, so all I did was set up uh, there's your function x squared minus 2. And then I set up a Newton iteration and I set up interval bisection. As a, as a means of trying to approximate the solution. So for Newton's method, I start with a guess of two. For interval bisection, I start with the interval from one to two, and I just let it loose. Okay. Um, right, and I'm going to get, I actually am going to be interval bisection an advantage here, you'll see. So with Newton's method, first guess two, Next guess, 1.5, and I let interval bisection go twice, just to be nice, right? So interval bisection says you cut the interval from one to two in half, and the picture I drew is wrong, because at 1.5, the function is positive, so you keep this half, and then you cut it in half again, and you the interval from 1.5. So two steps in, um, we got it narrowed down to somewhere between 1.25 or 1.5. Okay, so you just you know do it a few times. Um, and notice, even at this early stage, Newton appears to be winning because we all know that root, that root two is like 1.414, et cetera, et cetera. We're getting pretty close with Newton's method. Interval bisection is plodding along, you know, it's had, it's had four tries, uh, but it really, I mean, Let's go long enough that uh, Newton's method actually stops improving there, okay? It didn't stop, but you can see that the only, um, I'm what, six guesses in, six improvements in, and I just went from a number that ends in zero, nine zero to a number that ends in eight nine. If I do it again, Change here. Okay, six tries, and I'm at 25 digits back. Let's see here. Where is interval bisection? Now it's seven tries, by the way. Interval bisection is languishing at about there, right? We're about three digits in. Okay. So with interval bisection, you're just you're 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 cutting the width of the interval in half every time. You're adding one binary digit of accuracy each time. Or if you're working base 10, every three or four times you add a digit of accuracy because two cubed is eight, two to the fourth is sixteen, ten is somewhere between. Okay, the Newton's method though, if you pretend that your root, let's say your root is just zero, or just for the sake of argument. If it's zero, there's no point in any of this. But um, if your root is zero, then um, n of x, uh, you can do a quick you know, back of the envelope computation 
And what you'll find is n of x is x squared times, I want to get this right, f double prime of zero over f prime of zero plus and minus. Right? Provided, um, you'll notice I'm going to need f prime of zero to not be zero. We the proof is not degenerate, but let's ignore that whole um, complication. All right, so with Newton's method, you're square. What happens when you square a small number like 0.001? You get twice as many zeros as, as you had before. You, get, you have this extra constant out front, but compared to the squaring part, it, it's, it's almost irrelevant. You double the number of digits back to see every time. So that's, that's really the best thing at all. It, it, of all. If you start with a guess that's at all reasonable, you're going to find your route to any desired accuracy. Yeah, really quickly. Um, right, so what's the problem? The problem is, is I, mean, I mean, you need that first guess, okay? If you go back to this picture, you know, there are, there are some bad ideas for first guesses here, like that one. Okay, if you guess anywhere near the bottom of the parabola, Newton's method's gonna shoot you off to infinity, although you see it come back. <laughs> I mean, I'm only doing 10 guesses. I sent myself out nearly to infinity for this function. You know, it, it, it just came back, all right? So that's, that's it's kind of lucky. Okay, if I were really unlucky and went right there, I'd be in trouble. Um, if, I, if you wanna make it harder for yourself, you can change the function uh, to something like, that, okay, x squared plus one, and then it gets harder for Newton's method to converge. Um, yeah. uh, so if you want to drive yourself crazy, try to do impossible stuff. Um, right, it, it won't converge, but actually from the point of standpoint of dynamical systems, this is extremely interesting. This is an important example in dynamical systems. What you can prove here is that as you move, uh, as you move this initial guess around, um, I'm tempted to change the iterations to like 100, but I'm afraid of breaking something. Um, it turns out that if you move it even just a little bit, um, you will find an initial guess that's periodic, you know, bounce around and then come back. No matter, you can make arbitrarily small changes and get like periodic. I mean, if, it might take a million iterates of Newton's method to come back to where it started, but we will find periodic stuff. But on the other hand, with probability one, if you just make a random first guess, it turns out, and then you let it go forever, it turns out that the sequence of guesses you get is dense in the real world. All right? So just wild, wild stuff happens here. And yet, there, um, you can say quite a bit about this from a, a dynamics point. So it's not, it's not irrelevant. All right. But you need a good first guess at a root, and I guess part of that is you need a root in order to have a good first guess. Um, okay, so now I, I, I guess the title of my talk is what? You can start with the clueless, all right? Clueless refers to the guess. What if you don't have a good first guess? Um, what if you can't, like, you can stare at the graph? Great, but when I was doing the research for the physicists, you know, the, the degree A column, you know, would keep changing. I didn't want to stare at the graph every time I had to write my program to just automatically find roots of the things. So, so the rest of my talk is, is, Consider this that we're aware of, that I'm aware of at least uh, was the mathematician Cayley. Somebody, I just met somebody named Cayley right here. Right there, <laughs> so here you go. Um, Arthur Cayley, British mathematician. Um, I don't know why it takes a pleasure in showing their pictures. But, 
There he is. We can trust this. Now. She's in the nation's century. That's how long. So Kaylee, what he did was he said, well, let's take something like x squared minus two. In fact, let's just take a quadratic polynomial and apply Newton's method to it. And let's ask what happens with just an arbitrary first guess. And so to, to build on, I don't know your name, but you were asking earlier about starting a complex guess. And that also was part of Kaylee's idea. Let's not, I mean, because some polynomials like x squared plus one have complex roots. Let's allow complex guesses. All right, so what are we looking at? So this, this is a picture of a complex plane. All right, horizontal <laughs> axis, real number, vertical <laughs> axis, imaginary number. Recognize it? <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see, I didn't see any roots there. <laughs> ah, there we go. There are the roots of a real polynomial. In fact, I don't know if you can read the coordinates. I guess the coordinates are kind of visible. That should be about one, and that should be about minus one. And Kaylee's question was, let's say we just take a random guess, see what happens. Um, so I'll do that. There. I just started at this, this complex number, whatever it is, it's 2.8 plus 2.4i. And the guesses lead me right down to... So what this... Polygonal line does, okay, so that it, it just pops. It just interpolates one guess to the next and gives you a, a little curve here, moving into the root. So guess one, guess two, guess three, so on. What's that? The 10? Uh, the, the little arc that's coming off. Oh, yeah, right. So here, I, I stopped at a convenient place, right? The arrow is pointing to the first guess. The line drops you, connects to the second guess, just for the actual. Um, and it jumps up to the third. And at the fourth guess, you can't tell. In fact, it's doing 10, but okay. you can't even see the others. They're all in the asterisk there. Okay? And uh, if you start elsewhere, you might go to, you might find the root minus one instead. Minus one, one minus one, like that. Okay, um, or you can just do something like this. Um, you can just color all the points in the plane based on which root they're going to. So maybe just let me put you off for one second. All the points colored red are first guesses that find the root one when you apply Newton's method over and over. All the points colored blue are guesses that find minus one. And the, the uh, shading, the dark light, dark light, is just an indication of how many tries you have to do until you land on the asterisk, until you're close enough. But by whatever definition, close enough. I mean, so does it take an odd number of steps or any number of steps to get close enough? All right. And it's very logical what happens. This is what Kaylee realized is that guesses, so you have, um, maybe I'm going to conjecture a theorem at this point. I mean, if you see this picture, it's uh, you know, kind of clear. What happened. Let me ask, let you ask your question. Sometimes you could ask, what would happen if you put your initial guess exactly equidistant from two or more zeros? Ah, I claim I have already shown you that. Um, but that, that what, you know, let me sit on that for just a little bit. Um, I mean, I can try. The problem is getting things exact. There, you did it. You, it looks like you just stay on the fence, start on the fence, stay on the fence. In fact, I said you already saw this. When do we see it? Probably x squared plus one, plus or minus i, and the real axis is the, you know, the. Yeah, so the x squared plus one example, just this, this picture turned on its side. Okay, and by guessing on the real axis, I was guessing exactly on the fence. And that, yeah. So, all right. So, but maybe it's just symmetry, right? I mean, these roots, this x squared minus one is very symmetric polynomial. So maybe I just need to move the roots. Uh, move that root there. And for good measure, I'll just move that one too. And a refresh. Same thing. All right. Uh, this is what Kaylee recognizes. You just draw a line segment. Between these two things, yes. Ah, oh, right. I, I just decided 
with my mouse cursor, um, that instead of roots plus one and minus one, the roots would be minus 0.578 plus 0.56i, that this coordinate thing down here, and 0.56 plus 1.56i. A quadratic polynomial is specified by its roots. I so, Sure. Yeah, yeah. Instead of telling the program what the coefficients are, I just tell what the roots are. I mean, it's, it's more convenient than the graph. Yeah. Uh, maybe you'll get to this tomato. Uh, maybe, you'll, you, maybe you'll get to this tomato, but does something interesting happen if you change the multiplicity of one of the roots? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I was going to duck that right. Can I answer that one after the talk? Because that's kind of like a quarter of case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's okay. Interesting stuff does happen. Yeah, Newton's method works a lot less well if you have a root of Yeah. Does this also have like an edge case Yeah, this one too. I mean, the, the edge in this case is what is this line? In general, what line is dividing things here? Yeah. Magic words from high school Perpendicular bisector. Perpendicular bisector. Right, you have two roots, you have a line segment, they're the perpendicular bisector. That's the thing that divides the red from the blue. Now, and Kaylee proved that, all right? Kaylee was a great mathematician. But now that you've seen this picture, you could go home and prove that tonight, all right? I guarantee it. You spend some time, you'll prove it yourself. The, the, the now, Kaylee did not have the advantage of being able to look at the picture, all right? So his, you know, he figured this out without, you know, all he had was pencil and paper, so. A certain advantage and it, it kind of hampered him so he wanted to go he his he's like great we got the quadratic case anybody who's been a mathematician for a certain amount of time has an experience with this you write a paper you make a certain amount of progress on some problem and you're feeling good about yourself and in the introduction you say and we're going to come back to this more elaborate case later on and then you never do okay <laughs> so kaylee kaylee says in 1879 so the case of a cubic polynomial appears to present considerable difficulty uh, and, uh, but then, I mean, he, 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 was, he also suggested he's going he to tackle that one. <laughs> but 10 years later, and in French, um, I, I don't know, I mean, French was, it, it wasn't maybe being deliberately obscure back then. French was, uh, well, lingua franca in that day. Uh, but 11 years later, he comes back and, and says, um, I hope to apply this theory to the case of the cubic equation, but the calculations are much more difficult. And he never speaks to the subject again. Right? Okay. I mean, he drops it, all right? So this is why he dropped it. This, okay, what makes, what, how do you turn a quadratic polynomial into a cubic polynomial? You add one more root. I just picked one at random. And now Newton's method, if I take a guess, all goes well, I'll find one of those three roots and I should color the point based on which of the three roots I find. There. Okay, so um, Kaylee didn't, he didn't know what he was talking about. All right. Um, is that practical? Oh, yeah, it's very, very, yeah, yeah. If you pick, um, I don't know how much time, I, you can make your, you can sit here and play with the program all day long. Uh, if you just crop a little piece of this, and then you crop a little piece of that. And then you crop a little piece of that. Yeah, it, it is, you keep just getting the same thing. Very complicated um, and a little hard to imagine giving a description, right? So I have a back button. See how fast I can go back. Okay. That was the original picture. Okay, so it looks hopeless. It looks like you should not be able to, uh, you know, prescribe guesses that will, whoops, wrong setting. Uh, I want to track orbits. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of hard to say where the band, where the blue ends and the green begins. And not only that, there are green pieces in the middle of the red and the blue pieces. You can kind of hop around from one green island to the next until you land into the big one. And so it's very difficult to say in, in words, you know, what's going to happen here. And it doesn't get any better if you add more words. I could, I could 
do that. Actually, maybe I will just for the sake of it. Um, I have it. There's a point. It's, uh, put. <laughs> it's it's really not. This is this is what you got here. And yet, I told you there was a paper about this. Um, but it's really remarkable. Um, what eventually we did learn how to deal with this situation, we being of people other than myself. People I have to my post off with. Um, okay, so what can you say about this picture? Well, there are a lot of red islands in the picture, but there's one big one that that contains the one root here. So Something that people figured out fairly early on. So that big red island is um, what in dynamics we call the immediate basin. Red okay, to distinguish it from the little red islands, which are not joined up to the big one, those are part of what we would call the basin, but not the immediate basin of the red root. The one thing that people do is that that immediate basin is always simply connected. Same with the purples, same with the blue, same with the yellow, same with the green. The immediate bases are always, but they call simply connected, meaning they don't have any holes in them. All right, they're not like Swiss cheeses. They're just, they may be all distorted and stuff, but if you kind of scrunch them around, topologically speaking, they're just, you know, all right. That was, that was important. Um, so that was one thing that came to March. And let me say next. Um, I'm not going to give you much of a year for this. This requires some technology. But a year of rather complex analysis, I can do it. But um, here I can just you know, give you some suggestions about how all this works out. All right. Um, so I said topologically, this thing is yes. So if you what you can do in complex terms is, is make a kind of change of coordinates so that the thing really is a disk. And you can put the root right in the center of the disk. This is what's known as the Lehman mapping. Every symbol is connected to the subset of the domain, of the plane, which is not, you know, omit at least one point per plane, can be complex differentially transformed into the disk. Okay? And then you put the root at the center. And remember, I said um, that near the root, Newton's method is basically looking like x squared or constant on x squared. Now, under decent circumstances, you can make Newton's method be literally x goes to x squared. Okay. This is not always, I mean, I'm saying under some further restrictions, which are not that important here. And one thing about x is x squared, or maybe if you want to think of this as a complex number, z gives z squared. The origin goes to the origin, as it should. The root, if you find the root, you stay at the root. But there are other points that are sent to themselves by z gives z squared. So what's another one? One. If you plug one in, you just get one back. So right on the edge of the immediate basin, there's another point which is fixed. Okay. Which is really peculiar because that point, you know, I was expecting that. I wasn't really expecting another one. I was expecting the points that are fixed with these roots. Okay. But if you look at the, and if you look at the formula for Newton's method, um, it was called, I started using Z. Z gives Z minus um, F of Z over F prime of Z. If you set that equal to Z, cancel the Z, it looks like that should be zero. But it's missing one thing, infinity, okay? It turns out that infinity, okay, if you plug in a large value of Z, 
you will get another large value of z back. A little smaller than before if you if you if you try it out. But but large things go to large things, which means in some ideal sense, all the way to infinity, infinity wants to go to itself. Whatever infinity means in complex analysis it has very specific meaning. Okay, infinity. So there's one more fixed point, and somehow that has to correspond to this thing. And what that means in terms of the picture is that the immediate basin has to touch infinity. So if you follow it out, if you start zooming out on this thing, Okay, no matter how far out you go, the immediate basin never ends. It goes all the way to infinity. Hubbard, Schleicher, and Sutherland, the authors of that paper I showed you at the beginning, um, one of the things they prove is that every immediate basin, through every immediate basin, you can access infinity. And not just, you can access, not just in some piddly way, like going out through here, but, you know, it's through a big, wide wedge going out through infinity. They estimate the size of that wedge, all right? Um, and they prove the same thing for the basin of every group. So, other theorem, every immediate basin. The immediate basis of every root. Oh, this is a really bad grammar. Every immediate basis of a root has a big channel for access. Um, okay. And they realized they could cash that statement in for an algorithm. All right, so now the idea behind first guess is so I want to find all the roots of some polynomial using Newton's method. Um, and I know that each one has an immediate base and a big axis to infinity. If I can start to quantify everything, and what I should just do is take a big circle, put one initial gap, they evenly distribute a bunch of initial guesses around this circle, and one of them is guaranteed to fall into that channel here. So, specifically, if you evenly distribute It's the case that when you step a little to the right or a little to the left of something that's known, 
you're just in completely unknown territory again. So if you're looking for a project for next summer, <laughs> We go. What is the analog of this theorem? For, for instance, Newton's method applied to two polynomial equations. In two ones. Most of the time, you don't run into just one equation. You get a system of equations you want to solve. And if it is called an ordeal, I mean, nobody has any idea. I've seen pictures. Hubbard was running around drawing pictures of this for a while. It's just pictures. <laughs> There's no theorems. Yeah. Um, also, uh, there's a related method I was alluding to earlier. Called the secret method. Okay, and in some ways it's simpler than you can. Some ways simpler, some ways more complicated, but it doesn't use derivatives. At least not literally. Okay, so say you want to find the roots of the polynomial, don't take one guess, take two. Okay, and instead of approximating the graph of your function with the tangent line, just draw in the secant line and look and see where it crosses. Okay, so now you've got three guesses. You only need two to use the secant method, so you trash one of them and then keep the other two, and then you do it again. So now you're going to draw this secant line, find yourself a new guess, get rid of that one. All right, and then you're going to find a new secant line. And so it's a means for taking two guesses and getting yourself, you know, one new one to go with one of your old ones and so on. Um, what's a good set of initial guesses to use for secant that nobody knows right now? It should be pretty amenable to at least computer experiments, but I'm not even aware that anybody's done that in this case. So, oh, maybe I should end. I, uh, I was showing pictures. Um, Actually, okay, that's Kurt McMullen, who has not figured into this talk, but he won a field now, so. <laughs> um, there he is, John Hubbard uh, Cornell, who was a postdoc mentor. Uh, Dirk Schleicher, who was his student, who is currently, I think, in Marseille. And Franz Hubbard also has a job in Marseille now. Um, and Scott Sutherland, who's at Stony Brook. Those are the three authors of, of the paper that proves that theorem. So I'll stop there. Thank you.